Today we're pleased to have on the show Fatima Johnson, who is the organiser of the Adbourne Film Festival. Welcome, Fatima. Hello. Can you tell us a bit about the background to the festival and what it brings to the town? Well, the festival was started in 1996 by the then mayor of Adbourne, Joanne Smith. She wasn't a filmmaker herself. She'd actually been a very energetic tourism development officer for many years. But Adbourne had run a classical music festival, which had been becoming less and less popular in recent years. Joanne was looking around for something to replace it, and to use funds allocated to it, to promote something which local people can enjoy. <laughs> Great. So, tell us about the festival nowadays. Well, it's held in the last two weeks of August every year, and short films from all over the world are shown in three places, uh, in the theatre and our two cinemas. Several films are shown in one performance, and the whole thing lasts about 90 minutes. Tickets are very reasonably priced. Under 12s used to get in for 50p, but now we charge just £1, which is still very good value. £1.50 for students and £2.50 for everyone else. Performances are advertised all round town and also on our website, www.adbornfest.com. If you're interested in attending any performance, you can buy tickets online, of course, and you can also get them in the library, which is right next to the main shopping area. I'm afraid this year... Tickets are no longer available from either of the two cinemas because of restricted opening times. Oh, I understand you also run a film competition? Yes, for under-18s. We have a different theme every year. Last year, for example, the theme was Future Planet, and the winner was a ten-minute documentary encouraging youngsters to be more aware of environmental issues, focusing on getting school kids to cycle to school instead of going by car. This year, the theme is Sporting Nation, so there'll also be lots of ideas to choose from. Now, we're always on the lookout for new local talent, so if you live in the Adbourne area and are under 18, you should have a go. We have an excellent prize every year donated by local businesses, shops, hotels, etc. This year, you can win a high-spec movie camera worth over £800. Application forms are on the website, and the deadline for sending in your film to enter the competition is the last day of July. It's May now, so you'll have the whole of June to be working on it. And what are the judges looking for? Well, although we choose very topical issues like the environment, we're not looking for propaganda, you know, trying to get people to do something. <laughs> Instead... We're looking for a new angle, a fresh way of looking at a theme. And, of course, because it's a short film festival, it's not really about a fully worked story with well-rounded characters. It's more about good photography, conveying things visually. Mm. And who judges the films? A panel of three people who know a lot about film. We've used the same judges for many years, and we're very happy with their expertise. One thing we probably will change next year, though, is we want to add another class and another prize for older filmmakers. We'll keep it at a maximum of ten minutes, though. The length works well for our festival. We also want to use different venues for the film shows, such as community centres, and at least one school. It might make performances more accessible to a wider audience. We did explore the possibility of having late-night showings, but that's unlikely to happen in the coming year. So, as I say, if anyone's interested in submitting a film for our competition, go on to our website and you'll be able to access... Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Cambers offers more than other theme parks. Like them, 
we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5, just half an hour before closing time. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide, Whiz down the polished vertical slide, nine metres in height, and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium, with 16 carts, 
eight for single drivers and eight for kids preferring to ride along with mom, dad, or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One style carts, but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 meters because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background and so forth, and then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background. As everyone knows, all living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which of course in most fishes are located either side of their head. But human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim underwater like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. I don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably underwater. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ, that is, directly from the water, while swimming? In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. He believed our lungs could be bypassed and we would learn to live underwater just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water, ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe, but also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air underwater, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay underwater for long periods by breathing from this bubble which they hold under their wing cases. By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy, more straightforward. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down underwater. But a crucial factor is that the diver has to keep the water moving so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, 
and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I yes. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. There's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives, thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, approximately 53 million litres of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres. Enter this into the calculator, along with the type of surface you're painting, and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint. They will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities, and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on communityrepaint, all one word, dot org dot uk. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using then paint a board and move it around the room so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also, it's always better to buy high quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting.
In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional-looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy. So washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, Long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water, because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, Leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. In tomorrow's programme, I'll be giving some advice on... Good afternoon. This is the first of a series of lectures I'll be giving about engineering for sustainable development. I'll be presenting examples of engineering projects from a variety of contexts and today I'm going to talk about a project to design a new kind of greenhouse for use in the Himalayan mountain regions. First of all I'll tell you about the problem which was the context for this project. In the Himalayan mountains fresh vegetables and other crops can only be grown outside for about 90 days during the summer because the altitude of the region is around 3,500 meters and because the rainfall is so low. In winter, temperatures fall below minus 25 degrees centigrade, so fresh vegetables have to be imported. They arrive by truck in summer or by air in winter, which makes them expensive. Local people rely on dried leafy vegetables and stored root crops during the winter and rarely eat fresh vegetables. But despite the sub-zero temperatures, the skies over the region are cloudless and there are over 300 sunny days per year. So, an engineering solution was needed to exploit the sun's energy and protect locally produced plants from freezing during winter. And in fact, there had been programs in the past to provide greenhouses but these were unsuccessful. The greenhouses weren't adapted for local conditions, so they tended to fall into disuse. So, a few years ago, a project was initiated to design a better greenhouse, one which would meet the criteria for sustainability. So, what are the criteria for sustainability? Well, first of all, the new greenhouse is designed to be relatively simple, so construction is cheap. Locally available materials are used wherever possible. The walls are generally constructed of mud bricks, made locally, although in areas of high snowfall, more resilient walls of stone are needed. Rammed earth is also used. The main roof is generally made from locally available poplar wood with water-resistant local grass for the covering. In addition, the construction and maintenance of the greenhouse 
is done by local craftsmen. So local stonemasons are employed to build the greenhouse walls and specialized training is provided for them wherever necessary. Then, the greenhouse is designed to run on solar power alone. There's no supplementary heating. And lastly, families are selected to own one of the new greenhouses with great care. They have to have a site which is suitable for constructing it on. They also have to be keen to make a success of using it and also to share the produce with the wider community through sale or barter. Potential owners are taken to see existing greenhouses before they make a final decision about having one. So, those are the features which make the project sustainable. And now, I'll briefly describe the design of the greenhouse. The greenhouses are orientated very carefully along an east-west axis so that there's a long south-facing side. The transparent cover on the south-facing side is made from a heavy-duty polythene, which should last for at least five years. On the inside of the greenhouse, the walls are painted. The rear and west-facing walls are black to improve heat absorption, but the east-facing wall is white to reflect the morning sunlight onto the crops inside. Finally, there's a door in the wall at one end, and vents are incorporated into the roof, the door, and the wall at the other end to enable control of humidity and prevent overheating. I'll turn now to the benefits which have resulted from the introduction of these new greenhouses. These benefits are of various kinds, but for now, I'll just mention the social benefits. First of all, people who own a greenhouse gain social standing in their communities because they provide vegetables for the wider community, for regular consumption as well as for festivals, and they also earn income. Secondly, because in rural areas it is women who usually grow the food, the greenhouses have increased their opportunities. They bring the benefits of improved nutrition and increased family income from the sale of surplus produce. And thirdly, as a result of their improved financial position, some families can now afford to educate their children for the first time. For my short presentation today, I'm going to summarise the work I've done so far on my research project to explore expertise in creative writing. Essentially, I'll share with you the process I underwent to gather my interim findings. First of all, I should give a little relevant background information about myself. Before I started my current degree course in cognitive psychology, I studied English literature. And, as you can imagine, this meant I spent a great deal of time thinking about the notion of creativity and what makes people develop into successful writers. However, the idea for this research project came from a very specific source. I became fascinated with the idea of what makes an expert creative writer when I read a well-known 20th century writer's autobiography. I won't say which one at this stage, because I think that might prejudice your interpretation. Anyway, this got me thinking about the different routes to expertise. Specifically, I wondered why some people become experts at things, whilst others fail to do so, in spite of the fact that they may be equally gifted and work equally hard. I started to read about how other researchers had explored similar questions in other fields. I began to see a pattern that those studies which involved research in a lab were too controlled for my purposes, and I decided to avoid reading them. I was quite surprised to find that the clearest guidance for my topic came from investigations into what I call practical skills, such as hairdressing or waiting tables. Most of these studies tended to use a similar set of procedures, which I eventually adopted for my own project. I'll now explain what these procedures were. I decided to compare what inexperienced writers do with what experienced writers do. In order to investigate this, I looked for four people 
whom I regarded as real novices in this field, which proved easy, perhaps unsurprisingly. It proved much harder to locate people with suitably extensive experience who were willing to take part in my study. I asked the first four to do a set writing task and, as they wrote, to talk into a tape recorder, a technique known as Think Aloud. This was in order to get experimental data. Whilst they were doing this, a research assistant recorded them using video. I thought it might be helpful for me in my transcriptions later on. I then asked four experienced writers to do exactly the same task. After this, I made a comparison between the two sets of data, and this helped me to produce a framework for analysis. In particular, I identified five major stages which all creative writers seem to go through when generating this genre of text. I think it was fairly effective, but still needs some work, so I intend to tighten this up later for use with subsequent data sets. I then wanted to see whether experienced writers were actually producing the better pieces of writing. So I asked an editor, an expert in reviewing creative writing, to decide which were the best pieces of writing. This person put the eight pieces of work in order of quality, in rank order, and using his evaluations, I was then able to work out which sequence of the five stages seemed to lead to the best quality writing. Now, my findings are by no means conclusive at this point. I still have a long way to go. But if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And get... Good morning, everyone. For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, Female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction than male full-time workers. Secondly, female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained, perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers to see where there may have been problems. This is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups. Also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example, there were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. And workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results.
In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated. Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Outdoor Survival Program. As you know, this week you'll be learning some of the basic information and skills you need to look after yourself independently in the outdoors. These first two days we'll be based here in the classroom and then we'll be taking a camping trip to put into practice some of the things you've learned. I'm going to start off with the topic of food and to start with I'll describe just two methods which we'll be putting into practice at our camp and which make use of natural resources, the steam pit and the bamboo pot. I've got two posters here to make things clearer, and I'll start with the steam pit here. To make this, you'll need some dry sticks, some grass, some loose earth, and some stones. And for this week only, some matches. <laughs> the first thing you do is to dig a shallow pit in the place you've chosen to do your cooking. Let's say about 25 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Your sticks have to be a bit wider than the pit because you have to put a line of them along the top from one end of the pit to the other. Before setting light to these, you take some large stones and arrange them on top. Then you start the fire and wait till the wooden platform burns through and the stones fall into the pit. At this point, brush away any pieces of hot ash from the stones. You can use a handful of grass and then take another stick and push it down into the center of the pit, between the stones. After that, you cover the whole pit with a thick layer of grass. And then you can put your food on it, wrapped in more pieces of grass, like parcels. Finally, cover the whole thing with earth. You have to pat it firmly to seal the pit. Then all you have to do is take the stick out and pour a bit of water into the opening that it leaves. It should take about four hours for your food to cook as it cooks slowly in the steam that's created inside the pit. Simple, but effective. The other method you're going to practice this week is the bamboo oven. Now the steam pit is ideal in certain conditions because the heat is below ground level. For example, if there's a strong wind and you're afraid a fire might spread. But when it's safe to have an open fire, you can use the bamboo oven method. You get a length of bamboo, which, as you probably know, is hollow and consists of a number of individual sections with a wall in between. You use a sharp stick to make a hole in each of the dividing walls apart from the end one. Then you lean the bamboo over a fire with the top propped up by a forked stick and the bottom sitting on the ground. You pour enough water in the top to fill the bottom section and then light a fire underneath that section to heat the water. Then you put your food inside the top section and the steam coming up the bamboo through the holes you made cooks it. 
I'm going to move on now to food itself and talk about some of the wild plants you might cook. I'm going to begin with fungi. That's mushrooms and toadstools. I'm sure you'll be aware that some of these are edible and they're delicious, but some of them are highly poisonous. Now, whether they're poisonous or not, all fungi that you find in the wild should be cooked before eating because that helps to destroy any compounds in them that might be mildly toxic. But be aware that any amount of cooking won't make poisonous varieties any safer to eat. Unless you can definitely identify a fungus, you should never eat it. It's not worth the risk. And you need to be really sure because some fungi that are poisonous are very similar in appearance to certain edible varieties. They can easily be mistaken for each other. So having said all that, fungi are delicious when they're freshly picked, and although they are only moderately nutritious, they do contain minerals which the body needs. I'll move on now to leafy... Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is 9 to 5 p.m., but on Monday, because it's your first day, We'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us, then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognize you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, we say put on your own casual clothing because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now, we don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence and follow up if necessary. But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday or, the most popular, when they go out on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week, and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum, summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, You'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, 
There's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception, and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks, um, lunch, etc. Unfortunately, our cafe's closed at the moment, so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk, and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day, we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area, at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be... My presentation today is on how the science of genetics is being used to shed light on the origin of manuscripts, anything written by hand, produced in the medieval period, that is, the period between the 5th and 15th centuries A.D. As many of you know, thousands of medieval handwritten books still exist today. Some of them have a clear provenance, that is, we know exactly where and when they were written but the origin of many manuscripts has been a complete mystery. That is, until 2009, when geneticists started using DNA testing to shed light on their origins. But before looking at the new research, I need to explain something about the way the manuscripts were produced, particularly what they were written on. Virtually all were written on treated animal skins, and there were essentially two types. The first was parchment, which is made of sheepskin. It has the quality of being very white, but also being thin. It has a naturally greasy surface, which meant it was hard to erase writing from it. This made it much sought after for court documents in medieval times. The second type is vellum, which is calfskin. This was most often used for any very high-status documents because it provided the best writing surface, so scribes could achieve lettering of high quality. So, once the animal hides had been chosen, they had to be prepared. Where the right materials were on hand, the skins were put into large barrels or vats of lime, where they were agitated or stirred frequently. But if lime wasn't available, then the hides were buried. Both these techniques were designed to cause the hair to slough off and the skins to become gelatinous and therefore more flexible. The next stage was to put the hides on stretcher frames and pull them very tight. While on the frame, they were scraped with a moon-shaped knife in order to create a uniform thickness. For parchment, that was the end of the process. But for vellum, there was an additional stage where it was bleached in order to achieve the desired color. So, what does all this preparation mean for the quest to identify the origins of mystery manuscripts? Well, until recently, the only way historians and other academics were able to guess at origins was either through the analysis of the handwriting style or from the dialect in which the piece was written. But these techniques have proven unreliable for a number of reasons. It was thus decided to try to look at the problem from a different angle, to start from what is known, that is, the small number of manuscripts whose origins we do already know. Because these parchments and vellum are both made from animal hides, it was possible to subject them to DNA testing and to identify the genetic markers for the date and location of production. From this was created what is known as a baseline. The next stage was to test the mystery manuscripts, finding their DNA characteristics, and then making comparisons between the known and the mystery scripts. Genetic similarities and differences enabled the scientists to gain more information 
about the origins of the many manuscripts we had known virtually nothing about up to that point. Now you might ask, what are the potential uses of this new information? Well, obviously, it can shed light on the origin of individual books and manuscripts. But that's not all. It can also shed light on the evolution of the whole of the manuscript production industry in medieval times. And because that was such a thriving business, involving very large-scale movements right across the globe, the new data in turn help historians establish which trade routes were in operation during the whole millennium. Now, if anyone has any questions... For my presentation, I'm going to summarize what I've found out about efforts to save one plant species, the juniper bush. It once flourished in Britain and throughout the world's temperate zones, but over the last few decades has declined considerably. Before I go on to explain the steps being taken to save it in England, let me start by looking at some background information and why the juniper has been so important in cultural as well as ecological terms, historically and in the present day. Firstly, I want to emphasise the fact that juniper is a very ancient plant. It has been discovered that it was actually amongst the first species of plants to establish itself in Britain in the period following the most recent Ice Age. And, as I say, it has a much valued place in British culture. It was used widely as a fuel during the Middle Ages because when burnt, the smoke given off is all but invisible and so any illicit activities involving fire could go on without being detected. For example, cooking game hunted illegally. It also has valuable medicinal properties. Particularly during large epidemics, oils were extracted from the juniper wood and sprayed in the air to try to prevent the spread of infection in hospital wards. And these days, perhaps its most well-known use is in cuisine, cooking, where its berries are a much-valued ingredient used to flavour a variety of meat dishes and also drinks. Turning now to ecological issues, juniper bushes play an important role in supporting other living things. If juniper bushes are wiped out, this would radically affect many different insect and also fungus species. We simply cannot afford to let this species die out. So, why is the juniper plant declining at such a rapid rate? Well, a survey conducted in the north and west of Britain in 2004-5 to showed that a major problem is the fact that in present-day populations, ratios between the sexes are unbalanced and without a proper mix of male and female, bushes don't get pollinated. Also, the survey found that in a lot of these populations, the plants are the same age, so this means that bushes grow old and start to die at similar times, leading to swift extinction of whole populations. Now, the charity Plant Life is trying to do something to halt the decline in juniper species, it's currently trying out two new major salvage techniques, this time focusing on lowland regions of England. The first thing it's trying is to provide shelters for the seedlings in areas where juniper populations are fairly well established. These, of course, are designed to help protect the plants at their most vulnerable stage. A further measure is that in areas where colonies have all but died out, numbers are being bolstered by the planting of cuttings which have been taken from healthy bushes elsewhere. Now, I hope I've given a clear picture of the problems facing this culturally and ecologically valuable plant and of the measures being taken by plant life to tackle them. If anyone has any questions... Hello, everyone. I've been asked to talk to you this afternoon about next month's trip to Tamerton Study Center for the two-week course. Now, some of the things I'm going to say you may have already heard or read about, but I think it's important to emphasize a few key points. First of all, it's worth reminding you why Tamerton was set up in the first place, in the late 1960s. 
that was really before all the concern with preserving the environment, which everyone talks about these days. The idea was simply to get people out of the cities and into the country and to find out that just being outdoors can be very rewarding. This is not going to be a holiday in the usual sense. It's called an adventure course because you'll really be stretched to your limits, but that in itself can be a positive thing. The group I took last year, for example, said that although they actually felt pretty weak and exhausted all the time, <laughs> it really made them learn a lot about themselves and increased their confidence. And in the end, that's the most important thing. Now all of you knew about policies at Tamerton before you signed up for it, so you know that in many ways it's quite old-fashioned. You don't have a lot of choice in what you do, but something which I think makes the place so special is that you get to try so many different things every day. For instance, one day you'll do climbing, and the next you'll be surveying rock pools. It's not intended that you become an expert in any of them. It's more like a taster, which you can follow up if you want. And there isn't a lot of free time. Organized activities and talks, etc., go on until 9 p.m., and lights go out at 11 p.m. There are table tennis tables with all the equipment and board games, though I have to say, the pieces often go missing, so it's a good idea to take your own. There's a DVD player with a good selection of films suitable for this age group, so don't take yours. Bedtime at 11 p.m. is strictly enforced, and there's a good reason for this. You're all under 18, and we organizers need to know that all group members are accounted for in the house as we close for the night. And, of course, you'll be so exhausted anyway that you'll be too sleepy to want to cause any trouble. Now, what should you pack? The information sheet tells you a lot about what clothing to bring. But what about other things? Well, Tamerton House has its own small shop. But anything there is several miles away, so you won't have many opportunities for buying supplies. So in this last part of my talk, I'm going to explain what objects you should take with you to the center, what you can take if you want, and also, very importantly, what you cannot take. Several of you came up to me before this talk and asked whether you can take things like kettles or hair dryers. The answer is, there are plenty of these electrical appliances available in the center and they are of the proper voltage and are checked regularly. Yours may not be, so the rules at Tamerton say you can't bring them into the center because it's considered a fire risk. Remember, it's a very old house. Now another question was about cell phones. Although you definitely can't have them on during inside talks, you equally definitely need them when you're out on exercises. So they're a must, I'm afraid. Anybody who wishes to talk to me about borrowing a phone for the fortnight, please see me after this talk. Now, the weather's heating up at the moment, and you'll be outdoors a great deal. If you wear proper clothing, especially a hat, sun cream is optional. Also, they sell high-factor cream in the shop, so you don't have to take any of your own unless there's a special kind you use. Now, there's a special note about things like deodorants, which come in aerosol cans. I need to tell you that these are banned in the center, because apparently they have the habit of setting off the fire alarms. If you want to take an aerosol can, you'll actually be at risk of being told to leave. And finally, people have been asking about whether they need to take towels. Well, the center does provide one towel per guest, which you're required to wash yourself. If you're happy with that, then don't bring another. If not, take one of your own. Just remember how much outdoor exercise you'll be doing and how dirty and wet you'll be getting. Good evening, everyone. 
you're all likely to be familiar with pictures of the tawny owl because of all the owl species in the UK, it's actually the most common one. But the chances are that you're more likely to have heard one than actually seen one, as it's also strongly nocturnal. This means that it normally ventures out at night. So what kind of habitat does the tawny owl prefer? Well, a survey carried out in the 1980s confirmed that this owl is most likely to be found in woodland. If you look at a map of tawny owl distribution across Britain, you'll only see gaps in the treeless marshy areas of eastern England and in some of the more upland parts of northwest Scotland. However, you can sometimes find populations of tawny owls in urban areas too, either in parks or in large gardens. The tawny owl shows some obvious adaptations to its natural habitat. For example, both its wings and its tail are short, which helps it to manoeuvre through the trees. Also, the bird's plumage is a mixture of brown and grey, and this provides suitable camouflage for when the owl perches up against a tree trunk. Then there are its large eyes, the tawny owl's visual capacities are considerably better than those of humans, and although it can't see in complete darkness, it's sufficiently well equipped to be able to navigate its way around woodland on all but the most overcast nights. Another factor that contributes to the tawny owl's success as a hunter is its excellent memory of the layout of different areas. If you combine this ability with the owl's strongly territorial and sedentary nature, most populations of tawny owl are sit-and-wait predators, you realise that it has a good opportunity to predict where prey might be found. Finally, as well as having large eyes, the owl's sense of hearing is excellent, and this helps it to locate potential prey as it sits on its perch. Turning now to the tawny owl's diet. Woodland tawny owls feed mainly on mammals, especially small ones, such as wood mice and bank voles. But they'll also take things like frogs or bats or even fish if they happen to be available. In urbanised landscapes, the owls seem to prey more on birds. So there are some differences there. Let's just look briefly now at survival rates in the tawny owl. Young tawny owls face a difficult time once they leave home, and two out of every three are likely to die within their first year. So, with such high mortality levels, it's a good job that established breeding pairs can produce young over a number of seasons and maximise their chances of passing their genes on to the next generation of owls. I've already mentioned the sedentary nature of the tawny owl, but it's not just adult tawny owls that are sedentary in their habits. Young birds, dispersing away from where they were born, rarely move far. The average distance is just four kilometres. There also appears to be some reluctance to cross large bodies of water. The owl is absent from many of the islands around our shores, with only occasional sightings in Ireland and the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. Right, well, now I'll show you some photographs that have been taken in one or two... The valley and estuary of the River Trelore forms an unspoiled, beautiful landscape, rich in both wildlife and sites of historic interest. There are many ways to explore the area, and public transport links are good. It is possible to leave your car behind and travel by boat, train, or bus, with just short walks in between stops. The Trelore Valley Passenger Ferry runs between villages along the river estuary and provides a link with a train station at Barrie, which is about ten minutes walk from the riverside village of Calton. In the past, the river was the main form of transport in the area, 
And as in the past, today's ferry service operates according to nature. The river estuary is tidal, and so the ferry timetable differs from day to day, according to the times and height of the tide. The ferry is also seasonal, normally running between April and September, depending on the weather. A timetable for the whole year can be downloaded from the Internet by visiting www.trelorferry.co.uk. If you just want to sit and relax and enjoy the lovely scenery, you can take a river cruise to Calton and back from the nearby city of Plymouth. In the past, steamships brought early tourists along the same route. Queen Victoria and her family enjoyed such a trip in 1856. The journey is quicker these days. The round trip takes between four and five hours, depending on tides and weather. If you prefer, you can travel upriver by boat and return to Plymouth by train. All cruise boats and trains have wheelchair access. For more information and for departure times, ring Plymouth Boat Cruises on 017-528-23104. Trains run several times a day throughout the year between Calton and Plymouth, with various stops in between. They are used by both local commuters and tourists who want to enjoy the beautiful scenery. The highlight of the journey is crossing the river on the stunning viaduct, which was built at the beginning of the 20th century and towers 120 feet over the water. It is unnecessary to book, and tickets can be bought on the train. For information about fares and timetables, contact National Rail Enquiries by phone or online. The bus service in the Trelore Valley now connects all train stations and villages in the area. Especially for holidaymakers, there's a rover ticket which can be used at weekends and on national holidays and allows unlimited journeys on those days. The rover ticket provides great value for money and is now even cheaper than it was last year. An adult ticket costs £5.50 a day. Senior citizens can travel for £4.50, and a family ticket for up to five people costs just £12. Tickets can be bought on the bus. At the center of the Trelore Estuary area is the historic riverside village of Kelton. The main road comes into the village from the south, and for those of you who are arriving by bus, it turns left just before the bridge and stops in the lay-by on the left-hand side. From there, it's just a short walk to Calton's various attractions. If you're arriving by car, you have to leave it in the main car park. Go over the bridge and take the first turning on the right. Then go on until you come to the end of that road. It's the only place to park in Calton, but there's no charge. If you're interested in local history, there's a museum in Calton with farming, fishing, and household implements from the late 19th century. As you come in from the south, cross the river and go straight on the same road until you reach the end. Also, on the subject of history, you can go and see the old mill, which has recently been renovated and put back into use. Turn left before you come to the bridge, then go straight on and then take the first turning on the right. This leads straight there. If you're interested in arts and crafts, there's a potter's studio where you can watch the artist at work. After crossing the bridge, turn left, and it's the second building on the left. Finally, when you feel in need of refreshments, there's a cafe opposite the old boathouse and a picnic area near the...